Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So I thought we will um, we'll talk about um, evidence-based practice in general, and uh, um, I thought we should do a few um, few sessions on just discussing um, or giving an introduction to evidence-based practice. Okay, so this is the first of those um, talks. So what we'll talk about today is um, go over what evidence-based practice is or what ABM is and why we as surgeons and, and, and trainees need to practice evidence-based medicine. And I'll go through some pitfalls in evidence-based based medicine that we need to think about. And I'm sure all of you have heard of this uh, phrase, evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice. And uh, I thought it would be helpful to just refresh some of these basic concepts. Right, so uh, here's the definition of evidence-based practice, right? This was from uh, one of David Sackett's uh, paper. He is considered as one of the fathers of evidence-based practice. And he said, um, this is the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of current, current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And then he went on to say that this is uh, integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Okay, so let's just uh, dwell on that a little bit. So essentially, he says, you make use of, oops, there you go. You make use of clinical expertise and best available evidence, put them together along with what the patient would like to have done. And that, in a sense, will help you practice evidence-based medicine. In other words, it'll help you make decisions uh, about the care of your patients. Now, what is a clinical expertise? Now, let's just take something um, that most surgical trainees would be familiar with, um, i.e. the setting of acute appendicitis. And let's just think about the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. Now, the di in the diagnosis of acute appendicitis, I'm sure you'll agree that um, there is expertise involved. And this expertise incorporates clinical judgment and also proficiency. And you get judgment and proficiency from knowledge, knowledge about the anatomy of the appendix, the physiology and pathophysiology of uh, appendicitis, the natural history, and so on. And you get, um, uh, you also get better by practice, by seeing more and more patients with the right iliac fossa pain. And with the experience, you are able to make better judgments. Okay, so that's uh, common sense. Now, you, what we are saying, or what the proponents of EBM say, is that this alone is insufficient. And you also need to draw upon a, a data or uh, evidence on diagnostic tests to be able to then decide which diagnostic accuracy studies. They may even be clinical signs, like the SOAS sign or the Rothsing sign, or blood tests like the CRP and white cell count or clinical scores like the AAR score and um, uh, studies on imaging and so on. So um, it's important to keep ourselves up to date with the evidence base, in addition to the expertise that we gain with practice and experience, to then decide what to do next in a patient presenting with acute appendicitis. And last but not the least, you have to fit in um, or, or include uh, or incorporate patient values in your decision making. It may not necessarily fit in with what you consider best as the next thing to do. For example, if you're thinking of a CT scan and the patient wants to particularly avoid exposure to radiation, uh, you will need to um, uh, accommodate the expectations and the preferences. Not to mention specific uh, issues that are uh, um, 
important in individual patients like allergies to contrast or uh, morbid obesity and so on and so forth when you're deciding on, uh, let's say, doing a CT scan. Okay, so uh, why is this important? Now, traditionally, uh, we have relied on books. We've relied on received wisdom and how things are generally done in the place that you did your, uh, uh, your training. And you often hear people talking about our experience. In our unit, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. And it's always worked for us. Now, that the problem with that is, uh, as you might imagine, um, that is considered inadequate. And if you move from one unit to another, you might find that the practices are very different practices with regards to diagnosing appendicitis. And um, I hope you'll agree that this is also an unreliable um, sort of set of uh, uh, evidence to base your decisions on. Now, the other issue is that people would always say, uh, people would often say in the past, when I say past, I mean several decades ago, that uh, you know this particular test should work because it makes biological sense. There is this pathophysiological rationale for this. But um, basing your decisions on mechanistic explanations or pathophysiology is, is uh, often unreliable. And that's why you need evidence-based medicine because evidence-based medicine tells you to rely on empiric data, not just on theory. Has it actually worked in the real world? Uh, has it actually been tried in patients and what have the results shown you, okay? And, and uh, um, expertise alone, um, uh, clinical expertise alone, as we've discussed, is inadequate to guide your decisions without uh, empiric data. A lot of people would say, uh, oh, I base my decisions on my experience, but that experience is also empiric data and experience is not great data because as you might imagine, it often uh, depends on um, your recollection of, your, um, of uh, your experience. And there's good evidence to suggest that if you ignore uh, empiric data, uh, your outcomes may not be optimal. Right, so um, one of the other problems with clinical expertise is that although with more and more practice and experience, your clinical judgment will improve, your skills, your diagnostic skills, and also in surgery, your technical skills will improve. With experience, with just experience alone, your knowledge of the evidence base may not improve. And actually with age, uh, your knowledge uh, um, with, or your staying up to date with current knowledge may actually decline. You can obviously avoid this by regularly refreshing your evidence base. Uh, but there is uh, reasonably good data that shows that um, with age, performance might decline. And that's largely due to people not keeping up with the knowledge base. Right. So, um, so these are some of the reasons why we need to think about um, evidence-based medicine and see what best we can do um, to, to practice evidence-based medicine. So um, finding the evidence, understanding the evidence, and then incorporating the evidence, the results of the papers that you read into your practice uh, is therefore very important, but doing this in an effective manner is actually quite difficult because there's a lot of evidence out there and uh, finding the good quality, right evidence that answers your questions requires a lot of time and effort. And that process is simplified, I believe, by a good understanding. If you really understand the principles of evidence-based medicine and apply it regularly, then the time and effort is actually minimized, okay? Now, the first thing you need to think about um, to set about practicing evidence-based medicine in your day-to-day -day clinical work is to first think about the kind of questions, your know, clinical questions uh, where you need help um, from evidence-based medicine, clinical questions uh, that need uh, answering in your day-to-day -day practice. And just thinking of appendicitis, I've made a list of a few questions here. So the first question is, can I improve the accuracy of the diagnosis of appendicitis? Right? The second question is, does post-operative use of antibiotics reduce infection? 
Then you've got a question that asks, uh, are, do trainees do as well as consultants, or maybe better than consultants, when it comes to looking at outcomes after a penisectomy? Then you might be interested in what's the right way or the optimal way, if there is one right way of securing the base of the appendix. Is post-operative follow-up in secondary care necess necessary, or can you just discharge patients back to the GP and after appendicectomy? If you don't do an operation, what can I use to predict recurrence after conservative management? So these are examples of clinical questions that address practical problems. Now you could, if you're really interested, ask about uh, ask questions such as what causes appendicitis. What does the appendix do in terms of uh, its role in the in immunological system and its response to bacteria in the gut? Now, these questions aren't necessarily addressing practical problems. They are important, they are interesting, but they're not necessarily practical, right? So these kinds of questions are what are referred to as background questions in, in the realm of um, evidence-based practice. The questions that we discussed about, the, the, the list about, are referred to as foreground questions. So when you're reading about evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine, you might come across these kinds of questions called background questions and foreground questions. Now, just focusing on the foreground questions, and that's what we're going to do now, it is useful to classify these foreground questions into three or four main groups. The first uh, group is questions about diagnosis, and this also includes screening. So is one diagnostic test better than the other? That'd be a typical question. The second group is about uh, interventions and their efficacy and effectiveness. So this falls under the category of therapy and prevention. So is, for example, laparoscopic appendicectomy better than open appendicectomy? That would be a question. Is um, uh, so one analogies here better than the other, one set of antibiotics um, better than the other, and so on and so forth. The third uh, kind of question um, uh, or group of questions, clinical questions that are practical, um, would fall into the category of prognosis. So what's the prognosis of uh, this particular condition, or what's the natural history uh, of, uh, of a particular sort of complication? And then there's another miscellaneous group that includes questions relating to etiology, harm, quality of care, quality of life, costs, and so on and so forth. Some of these uh, overlap quite significantly with uh, the first three groups that we discussed on diagnosis, therapy, and prognosis. So grouping these questions then would lead you to uh, look for the appropriate study design or the ideal study design that will help you answer the question and here we're talking about primary research. We're not talking about secondary research or systematic reviews where you group all uh, primary research on a particular question and then try and collate the evidence and come up with a summa summary or a summative answer. So for example, for diagnostic and screening questions, the ideal study would be a prospective uh, study with a um, blind comparison with your standard. For therapy questions, questions relating to treatment, a randomized controlled trial, as you would um, expect. For prognosis and prediction, uh, you are going to need a cohort study. And uh, in the other, in the miscellaneous category, it really depends on the type of question. For example, for questions relating to incidence or etiology, you would want a cohort study to answer that question. For questions on prevalence, a cross-section study would be ideal. And, and uh, for questions on the other um, issues like harm and quality of life and cost, the study design really depends on the kind of question, but usually a randomized controlled trial would be appropriate. Now we'll talk about these study designs uh, in, a, in, a, in a later talk, um, but I thought I should introduce you to clinical questions and, and the ideal study design for different types of clinical questions. Okay, so now um, a few things to keep in mind when, when talking about evidence-based medicine. Now, there's a lot of focus on what we call empiric um, evidence. Empiric evidence relates to evidence that um, uh, uh, evidence from the real world 
uh, evidence from data that is observed, right? So, and the, and the many proponents of evidence-based medicine base uh, all of their arguments around uh, having empiric evidence and very often ignore mechanistic evidence by which I mean, if there's good um, pathophysiological rationale that something will work, uh, that often gets ignored um, with, with the proponent saying, well, there is no RCT evidence and therefore we're not going to employ that treatment. Now, this is often a problem in medical practice in a, when, when you deal with drugs and medications. But in surgery, uh, we have tended to um, go with the uh, with the practice that if something is likely to work, we, we, we just get on with it. And a really good example of this in, in general surgery is the adoption of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now, laparoscopic cholecystectomy very rapidly became the, the norm or the standard um, in dealing with um, uh, Goldstone disease without um, randomized controlled trial evidence saying that laparoscopy is better than open uh, cholecystectomy. And that was because the benefits were very, very obvious. The, the rationale was there. You didn't have to do a big muscle cutting incision and that increased inflammation and mobility and so on. So there's so much um, uh, mechanistic uh, explanation for it that we didn't really wait for uh, the gold standard randomized control trial to come along to show that laparoscopy is better. Um, however, so, so, so the, the point here uh, is that you should not ignore, I think, the, the pathophysiological rationale. Although if there's empiric evidence that that is much better, you should always consider the, the uh, mechanisms as to how an intervention uh, would work, as opposed to just seeing if it works in the real world. Now, if you are writing a protocol for a Cochrane review, if you're doing a systematic review and meta-analysis as part of uh, a Cochrane review, you will find that the Cochrane uh, want you to write about uh, mechanistic evidence. They want you to write a paragraph or two about how the intervention might work. So obviously people do give uh, importance to um, uh, mechanistic evidence, uh, at least the importance it deserves. Right, the second thing to think about is you may have all come across this, this pyramid, this pyramid of studies that uh, gives you uh, an idea of the importance of different study designs and the levels of evidence they provide in helping you make a particular decision. Now, uh, you might have uh, come across this problem and the problem is that uh, many of the proponents of EDM um, uh, would love you to think that the RCT evidence is the best available evidence. It often is, but not always. Now, uh, a poorly performed randomized control trial might actually not be that worthwhile or less worthwhile than a well-done cohort study. And that's often ignored. Um, often evidence from a randomized control trial, however poorly um, it may be done, is used to bin or shut down really good quality observational um, evidence. Uh, and then that's something um, you need to be aware of. Right, another thing is uh, uh, in, in uh, another problem, if you like, in the practice of evidence-based medicine is this thing called the inferential gap. So what is this? Now, if you're drawing evidence for, from randomized controlled trials to make a particular decision, you need to keep in mind that these randomized controlled trials are often done in patients, in selected patients, patients who fit very neatly your inclusion and exclusion criteria that the trial, that the people who designed the trial um, have, have uh, uh, implemented or laid down. And therefore, the results may not necessarily be applicable or generalizable to patients who do not fit those inclusion and exclusion criteria in patients with some unique problems or complicated uh, um, circumstances. Now, for example, let's talk about appendicitis. And if you're planning to do a CT for a patient with the right arterial force of pain to be able to diagnose appendicitis, and you've come across this meta-analysis and review, a Cochrane review that says a CT scan is, is, is uh, one of the best tools that there is, and the diagnosis of appendicitis is highly sensitive, highly specific, so it really trumps ultrasound 
and and all your clinical um, scores and CRP and what have you. And that may not necess necessarily be true for the patient in front of you because the patient in front of you might not be uh, the kind of patient that is, has been included in the RCTs. For example, you might have a patient that has got contrast and allergy, and therefore you can't do the standard uh, enhanced CT scan. You might have to do a, a non-contrast CT scan, and the trials and the meta-analysis may not have studied a non-contrast CT scan. It may also be that you have a patient that does not like uh, exposure to radiation and would like to be treated or managed without any exposure to radiation. Or the patient might be super obese that, is not, that does not fit into your hospital CT scanner. Or, and therefore, the, 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 uh, you have a problem. You have a lot of evidence on a particular uh, diagnostic modality or treatment, but you just can't apply that to the patient in front of you. And for many treatments, from many settings, you will find that randomized controlled trials have actually excluded a significant proportion of patients then that you will come across in day-to-day -day practice. And that's what is referred to as the inferential gap. Okay, the other uh, thing to think about is this difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. Clinical significance is the, is the difference that matters to the clinician and the patient. Statistical significance simply refers to the p-value, the probability that the observed results are due to chance. Okay, so it's important to understand the difference, and we might cover that again in another uh, session. So if you have a small trial, you may have some important clinical differences between groups, but because the trial is small and the numbers aren't great, you might not get the magical P of less than 0 0.05. On the uh, other end of the uh, problem, you might have very large administrative data sets that are being used to address specific questions. And they might, uh, the results from those studies might give you a significant p-value very easily, even if there is not much difference between, between arms. So even if the clinical uh, uh, improvement is only marginal or the clinical effect size is very low, you'll get a significant p-value. So, so that's something to be aware of. The other issue with trials particularly is that trials tend to um, measure outcomes or tend to focus on primary outcomes that are easily measured, not primary outcomes, not outcomes that need to be measured. And often trials will use surrogate outcomes because waiting for the final all important uh, outcome that matters to patients might make the trial too expensive or too lengthy. And in many trials, outcomes uh, do not reflect, even secondary outcomes do not reflect uh, what patients would like to be uh, like to be informed about. And the last thing to keep in mind is that, um, is that the issue with the reporting bias. So articles with negative results don't get published or are published in very low and back factor journals and they don't and don't necessarily reach a wide audience. And um, and the fact that there are, there are many, many studies in the, lit in the literature, including randomized controlled trials and the systematic reviews and meta-analysis that are poorly done, and the quality of evidence is rather poor. But just because it is published, people will start to quote the uh, systematic review or the meta-analysis and uh, uh, base uh, the results of that poorly conducted uh, study to guide their decisions. Okay, so we've come to the end of this, um, this uh, talk. So to summarize, we talked about what evidence-based practice or medicine means. Um, I hope uh, I've explained um, why it's useful for us to practice evidence-based medicine and how it helps us in our, in our decision-making. We went through some kinds of questions that EBM can help in answering. We talk about background questions and foreground questions and how foreground questions can be grouped into different categories, like questions addressing diagnosis, questions addressing prognosis, and, uh, and so on. We then talk about some of the pitfalls of evidence-based practice. So um, keep in mind that we shouldn't ignore pathophysiological explanations and mechanisms and, and, and then only focus on empiric data, we shouldn't do that. 
uh, you should be aware that RCTs may be poorly done and that observational studies uh, that are done really well might be better than uh, RCTs in many instances. We talked about the inferential gap where the results of RCTs don't necessarily apply to patients in front of you. We talked about um, statistical versus clinical significance and how we should be focusing on clinical significance. We talked about outcomes um, that are not necessarily important, that can be the focus of trials. And we talked about low quality evidence and reporting bias. So that's it, that's it for this talk. I hope that was useful. If you do have any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>